Did you know that going through menopause increases your risk for heart disease? Women are not many men, and as your hormones change during perimenopause and beyond, your risk for cardiovascular disease and other conditions like dementia and type 2 diabetes goes up. This episode is going to explain three specific ways that decreased estrogen after menopause, whether it's surgical or natural, increases your risk for cardiovascular disease. Be sure to stick around till the end to learn a bonus way that going through menopause can increase your risk for weight gain and disease. Knowing this information helps you create a wellness program specific to your stage in life that will lead to better results. I'm Dr. Morgan Nolte, founder of the Weight Loss for Health online course, community, and coaching program. As a geriatric physical therapist, I've seen the reactive side of heart disease, and it's not pretty. It's financially, emotionally, and mentally draining. I want to help you do everything in your power to prevent the condition in the first place. I believe knowledge is power, and when we know better, we do better. Each week, I bring you new content to help you lose weight, get healthy, and reduce your risk for disease. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to my channel. I would greatly appreciate it. Cardiovascular disease is an umbrella term that covers coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, and peripheral arterial disease, among others. We've all heard the standard advice that you'll find everywhere on the internet to reduce your risk of heart disease, like eat well, exercise regularly, get enough sleep, don't be too stressed, and don't smoke or drink too much. My goal as an expert weight loss coach and a doctor of physical therapy is to dig deeper and up level the standard advice to give you more specifics and action items that you can easily implement into your lifestyle to reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease. With heart disease being the number one killer of women in America, it's important to be informed about your risk factors and take consistent proactive measures to reduce these risk factors before they become full-blown disease. I'm going to cover prevention tips in next week's episode, but today is going to hopefully light a fire under your rear end if you're in perimenopause or postmenopause to kick your wellness into high gear now. First things first, we need to define perimenopause and menopause because it's such a misunderstood and under-researched area of a woman's life. Many women and their doctors often dismiss symptoms of perimenopause and menopause altogether. Women can be caught off guard in their 40s and 50s because they weren't aware of the changes that their body would be going through or how it would, would affect their health and their waistline and their mood. Perimenopause is defined as the years leading up to menopause when your period becomes irregular. Menopause is a point in time 12 months following your last period and postmenopause is the rest of your life after that. Women can experience perimenopause symptoms like hot flashes, weight gain, insomnia, mood swings, and irritability from fluctuating hormone levels as early as in their early 40s, although most women start perimenopause in their mid 40s. The average age of menopause is 51, but again, some women will experience menopause far sooner and others a little later. Women have it tough. We get to have periods for the first half of our life with monthly hormone swings, then we may get pregnant and have huge hormone shifts, and then we get to go through menopause and go on a downhill estrogen and progesterone roller coaster before we completely flat out to relatively low levels. Men, on the other hand, get to sail along in life with relatively stable testosterone levels, oblivious to the tremendous amount of mental and physical change a woman's body and brain goes through in her lifetime. We go through perimenopause for several years, and then even after menopause, those hot flashes and other symptoms can still come up. We live in a post-menopausal state for 30 plus years, and yet we still are treating women over 50 as if they are many men or younger versions of themselves. I won't go into too much detail here, but while lower levels of estrogen after menopause is a natural phenomenon, those lower hormone levels present significant physical and emotional challenges, including an increased risk of cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, dementia, and increased fat mass, especially around the midsection. 
I like to say that this is the point in a woman's life where she's faced with the hard reality that losing weight is not about eating less and exercising more. It's about hormones. Specifically, it's about insulin because insulin is your body's fat storage hormone and the primary determinant of your body set weight. I want you to notice something here. Let's take a look at common risk factors for various conditions that we know increase after menopause type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and dementia. Elevated blood pressure, blood glucose, insulin, triglycerides, a larger waist circumference, and lower HDL is not an exhaustive list, but my point here is that all of these risk factors are really symptoms of two underlying conditions, insulin resistance and inflammation. When you treat insulin resistance and inflammation, the rest of these risk factors will improve as well. You know the saying, when the tide comes in, all the boats rise? Same thing goes for insulin resistance and inflammation. When you deal with these factors, your entire health profile will improve. If you wanna learn more about how to reduce insulin resistance and inflammation, be sure to download my free 55 minute masterclass that comes straight from my online course. It teaches you the number one mindset shift you must make to lose weight and keep it off. Eight reasons the calories in, calories out theory, theory for obesity is dead wrong the real reason your lost weight comes back on usually with a vengeance and 16 ways to lower your insulin so you never feel stuck again. You can download that today for free at weightlossforhealth.com forward slash masterclass. Now something else may happen, especially if you're following what I recommend, which is a lower carb lifestyle with moderate intermittent fasting, and that's an elevated LDL. We used to consider this bad cholesterol, but this interview with Dr. Nadir Ali and the corresponding blog post dives into what may be an oversimplified topic and why when all of the other numbers are going in the right direction, for example, your triglycerides, insulin, glucose, and inflammation are coming down and your HDL is going up, we don't really need to worry about elevated LDL. The post gives you other tests to determine your heart disease risk rather than just having high LDL and starting a statin, which is the standard of care in medicine today and not recommended for postmenopausal women. So let's talk about the three ways that a decline in estrogen may lead to high insulin levels and subsequently the secondary side effects of elevated insulin like higher blood glucose, triglycerides, lower HDL, and an increased risk for heart disease. Estrogen is protective against insulin. The more estrogen you have, the more sensitive you are to insulin, and the less insulin you'll need to get sugar from your bloodstream into your cells for energy. Some common signs of insulin resistance are increased blood sugars, increased carb cravings, fatigue, weight gain, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, and elevated blood pressure. Estrogen is protective against belly fat. Estrogen causes a preferential storage of fat in your subcutaneous stores. Subcutaneous fat is under your skin, but above your muscle layer. This is the stuff that you can grab with your hands, where fat is meant to be stored. And estrogen helps store fat here, under your skin, particularly around your hips and thighs. When estrogen levels fall, you lose this protection and fat shifts from sub subcutaneous to visceral stores, also known as belly fat. This visceral fat is under your abdominal muscles and is more inflammatory than subcutaneous fat and can worsen inflammation and insulin resistance. That's why abdominal obesity, not overall obesity, is one of the criteria in metabolic syndrome, which is a cluster of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Decreased estrogen from your ovaries leads to weaker bones, which is one of the reasons a woman's risk for osteoporosis increases with age. Now you may be wondering, hey, how does bone health impact cardiovascular health? But hang in there with me because I want to clearly explain the connection. There is some debate as to whether age or declining estrogen is responsible for decreased bone mineral density in women. And one study I found compared three groups of women. The researchers in one study compared 14 women who had undergone a total hysterectomy or removal of the ovaries and the uterus during young adulthood, 14 normal perimenopausal women and 14 normal postmenopausal women. They found that bone loss was similar in the groups who had their ovaries surgically removed 
and the postmenopausal women, but women in natural perimenopause who still had higher levels of estrogen had better bone mineral density. Because bone loss in the group of young women who had their ovaries removed, differing from the perimenopausal group in menopausal status, but not age, was almost as great as in the postmenopausal group, differing both in age and menopausal status, the authors suggested that estrogen defici deficiency and not aging may be the predominant cause of bone loss occurring during the first two decades after natural menopause. When you get less estrogen from your ovaries, either because they've been surgically removed or you go through menopause naturally, your fat cells start to pick up the slack. In case you are multitasking, let me say that again because I found this really interesting when I first learned about it. Your fat cells make estrogen. More and more research is coming out about adipose or fat tissue and it's now considered an endocrine organ like your ovaries, pancreas, and thyroid gland, among others. So when estrogen goes down due to aging or removed ovaries, your fat tissue becomes your primary source of estrogen. Your body knows that estrogen is important and it likes to hang on to fat tissue more than before menopause now because that's where your estrogen is coming from. And that's just one of the reasons that weight loss becomes harder for women as we age and highlights the importance of adopting a healthy lifestyle as soon as possible. There's a direct link between your bone health and adipose tissue. Our body does need a certain amount of fat, but too much, which is very common, especially after menopause, increases our cardiovascular risk. That's why I'm a huge proponent of adequate protein intake and strength training for women in perimenopause and beyond. You need both adequate protein and resistance training to build muscle. And if you have strong muscles and bones from diet and exercise, your body will rely less on fat tissue for bone strength. And increased muscle mass improves insulin sensitivity and metabolism to make weight loss easier to maintain. Lastly, there's evidence that estrogen can stimulate nitrous oxide production in the vascular walls. Nitrous oxide is a vasodilator, meaning it expands the blood vessels, allowing more blood to flow through. This can not only reduce blood pressure, but increase the diameter of potentially constricted blood vessels due to atherosclerosis or a buildup of plaque within the blood vessel that reduces the diameter of the vessel itself. The nitrous oxide would help increase the diameter of that blood vessel and potentially reduce a complete blockage like in the event of a heart attack or stroke. Before we get to our bonus item, let's do a quick recap here for the ways that a decline in estrogen can increase your risk for cardiovascular disease. Number one, reduced estrogen leads to increased fat mass and a redistribution of that fat mass to the visceral area. Number two, reduced estrogen leads to lower bone mineral density. The body relies even more on adipose tissue for estrogen and sheer weight to maintain bone health. Too much adipose tissue, especially around the midsection, will increase inflammation, insulin resistance, and total body weight. It's kind of like a nasty cycle that fat leads to more fat. Number three, reduced estrogen leads to lower nitrous oxide levels and more vasoconstriction, leading to an increased risk for elevated, elevated blood pressure and blockages. And those are just three ways. New research is coming out all the time, and there may be even more ways we don't know about yet. One new thing that I saw was that estrogen can interact with different types of fat cells to influence energy storage and expenditure. Unless you're taking hormone replacement therapy, which isn't a long-term solution, you're going to be faced with the harsh reality that you have to prioritize your health, especially in perimenopause and postmenopause, if you wanna reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease, dementia, type two diabetes, fractures, and a host of other health conditions. All right, are you ready for the bonus way that menopause increases a woman's risk for cardiovascular disease? It's any and every form of stress. For women experiencing night sweats or insomnia or just general anxiety and depression that increase after menopause, getting restful sleep becomes harder and for some downright impossible. That chronic sleep deprivation is a form of stress on your body. Stress increases cortisol, which increases blood sugar, which increases insulin, which increases insulin resistance and elevates your body set weight. 
Now I know there's a lot of information on this graphic, so feel free to pause the video if you need to check out more detail about how different lifestyle factors affect insulin. And if you're listening to the podcast version, be sure to check this video out on YouTube. Further, you're not getting as much human growth hormone that's released when we sleep. Human growth hormone is important to build muscle and burn fat, so getting less of it will slow down your metabolism. So this is a double whammy for your weight and heart health. If you're in perimenopause and beyond and you're really struggling with weight loss, I'd encourage you to take a closer look at your sleep and stress habits. I like to say no amount of diet and exercise will help you lose weight if the underlying problem is chronic stress and or sleep deprivation. Here's a fun physiological fact about how cortisol works to further decrease estrogen levels that I learned in a fascinating book called The XX Brain by Dr. Lisa Moscone. If you haven't picked it up yet, I highly recommend you do. I'm, I learned a lot from it and I'm paraphrasing this next little bit from her book. All sex hormones start with cholesterol. The body uses cholesterol to make a hormone called pregnenolone, which is also known as the mother of all sex hormones. Pregnenolone is converted to progesterone and progesterone can then be used to either make estrogen or, or testosterone. This process is hijacked by cortisol when you're stressed. Your adrenal glands use pregnenolone too, but in order to make cortisol. When you're under acute but temporary stress, your body will reroute some of the pregnenolone to make more cortisol. Once the stressor is gone, cortisol produ production slows and your body resumes its normal estrogen and progesterone production. But when you're under chronic stress, your cortisol levels go up and remain high for extended periods of time. Your body has no choice but to keep making cortisol by stealing pregnenolone away from your sex hormones. Dr. Moscone outlines four consequences of this cortisol hijacking process. Your pregnenolone goes down, making you feel irritable. Your progesterone goes down, keeping you up at night. Your estrogen goes down, giving you hot flashes, and your thyroid slows down your metabolism, causing more fatigue and more weight gain. A couple more insights about sleep that contribute to weight gain. First, consider sleep like recharging your willpower and self-control. These aren't things that we should rely on to lose weight, but we do need to use them every day. And when we're drained, we just don't have the energy to always choose healthy things. Second, poor sleep increases ghrelin, your hunger hormone, and you'll typically experience more carb and sugar cravings. Third, poor sleep reduces leptin, or your satiety hormone. So you're hungry, but you're less likely to feel full. Men have it so easy, don't they? Now, I know that if this is the first time you're hearing this information, it may feel overwhelming and like you're gonna really have to work at weight loss if you're in perimenopause and beyond. And here's the truth, you do. It gets harder as you age, it gets even harder after menopause. Weight loss takes work and sustainable weight loss after menopause takes a specific strategy. Eating less and exercising more will not work. We have to outlast and outsmart our hormones to lose weight and keep it off. And I've created a step-by-step -step system to help you do just that in my online program, Weight Loss for Health. So if you haven't already joined, you can check that out on my website at weightlossforhealth.com forward slash join or get a free taster of the program with that masterclass that I mentioned earlier at weightlossforhealth.com forward slash masterclass. Be sure to tune in next week where I'm going to discuss specific things that you can do as a woman to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. If you found any value in this video or episode, please take a moment and subscribe to this channel. Turn the bell on to get notified. Be sure that you like it and share it with someone who may need to see it. That engagement tells YouTube it's good content and show it to more people. Thank you in advance for helping me spread the word and I'll see you soon in the next video.